you asked for it, you got it. I'm gonna explain all seven of Infinity's discontinued armies and how to beat them if you see them. These kind of are secret armies. You don't see them on the tabletop a lot. Steel Phalanx and Toha maybe, but I've only fought against the Shock Army once. What does it mean when an army is out of print? It means that the vast majority of all their model ranges are no longer being produced. Some models are available online or buried in local game stores. Others are simply gone. It is true that you can proxy an Infinity and it is highly encouraged. But it can be inconvenient and distracting to explain what your entire army represents every single game. The alternatives to proxying include collecting very rare metal models, which can be quite pricey and daunting for new players who are supposedly trying to play a game that's cheaper than the ones made by James Workshop. Even if you do collect the models, they are not fine wines that improve with age. See, Infinity uses metal models. Metal molds are cheaper to make than the polystyrene injection molds that Tommy, Var Laird, or James make. However, they also wear out much faster. There is a reason that Nottingham is still using sprues that are from before 9-11. Using metal means that they do have to leave some older sculpts by the wayside faster, but you see a much more rapid pace of improvement. This also lets them support more factions at a time. I've been waiting for years for new Iron Jaws models. If you don't know what I mean about the quality, maybe compare the most recent Franco Ariadne models to the brand new Cosmoflot box. It is self-evident. In short, new models are easier to collect, easier to assemble, and easier to make look good. However, they're not unplayable, and we'll discuss this more later. If you already own these armies or play against them, well, here's how to win with all seven discontinued armies. Acontecimento is Portuguese for event, and playing these guys feels like something special. They're stealthy, light, and use mimetism to sneak up before they go for a mid-range kill. Many of their units like the Bachmari are extremely flexible, and can be used in a wide variety of roles. All sectorials rely on fire teams, but many Ekholm units can actually operate independently from the main group and still be very effective. They shoot for the win while fully ensconced in cover, with the benefit of mimetism and minefields they set up. This is a powerful and winning strategy. They unfortunately lack in close combat and hidden deployment, but who cares? Mines are your shield, and sniper rifles your sword. The shock army of Acontecimento got a starter right before the whole sectorial was put on ice. Many of their models are, however, specific to the shock army with minimal overlap. I think they're worth playing if you can find some of the newer boxes. You can also use a few Aleph models in the range to bolster your forces. Neoterra is the capital of Pan-Oceania, and also the seat of the new Christian church. Their elite guard use the absolute fanciest guns, remotes, visors, and cloaking devices. That is what NCA is all about. Their troops are expensive and have good stats, and can be inflexible, but they make up for it. Neoterran bolts have extremely varied tools for any job. Klauswitz Ulans are tags with cloaking devices. They also can fill gaps in their roster with a few units from Aleph. NCA is very straightforward, and lacks the variety of weapons platforms that Pano usually likes. They double down on Pano's ballistic superiority, neglecting armor, control, and close combat in favor of unmatched raw firepower. They're probably not worth being your only faction. Think of NCA as being Pano with a little extra, rather than having a distinct playstyle. Caledonia is not too dissimilar from generic Ariadna. Their shooting is poor, but they make up for it with special ammo that can blast through armor. They also get to throw bricks made of Scottish Fury directly at the opponent, and if even one of them hits, it can ruin your opponent's day. Many of their units are very aggressive and inexpensive like the Wolvers, and they are supported by cheap infiltrators like the SAS. In short, the Scots win by mixing close-range assaults and long-range camo. Their biggest weakness is the addition change. CHA used to love bringing legions of screaming Highlanders, but with the 15 model limit, their effectiveness is somewhat hampered. Although out of print, the Scots are still well loved by Corvus Belly and the player base. The Caledonians are not a bad army to own, as many of them are useful in vanilla Ariadna, and the others are in sectorials like Cosmoflot. Just don't make them your only Ariadna purchases. If you really want to get into close combat, I might recommend playing Combined Army, Hak Islam, Cosmoflot, or a different game.
FRRM are all about light strike forces with relatively high-tech toys. The wealth of the French has allowed them to buy glue grenades, advanced visors, hackers, long-range rifles, and even a tag in the form of Anaconda Squadron. They get all this for relatively cheap by the standards of Pan-Oceania or Hak Islam. All their models are over-equipped with off-world tech, so it feels like everyone has a few more tools than normal. So what's their downside? The first is the same as CHA and all of Ariadna, an insignificant info war game. Yeah, they can take an Alguacil hacker, which is better than normal Ariadna, but it's ultimately a drop in the bucket. Further, it can be difficult to get value out of their expensive fire teams. You need to work hard to make it worth the points investment. But if you can, you're going to have a great time. Fire and move, hit and run, and defeat your enemy in depth. The other downside is that I think this is the hardest sectorial to find. Some models like the Anaconda can be used in Druze and Mirage 5 have a new miniature for Cosmo Flot, but, but like, aside from that, all the French minis themselves are absolutely gone from store shelves. Kapukalki represent the Merchant Guards, and that means money to spend. They get lots of cool mercenary options like Kaplans and Drews to bulk up their forces, and expendable idiots like the Yuan Yuan to clog up your opponents. They're good! They even have some really unique toys and tools. Kapukalki make liberal use of holo projectors and holo masks, which let you disguise miniatures as other miniatures with the Hafsa. Kapukalki was the first army to get Harry's fire teams, and rely heavily on having that second three person fire team for support. Like the rest of Hak Islam, Kapukalki play a game of control and asymmetric warfare. They have doctors for the expensive mercenaries, complemented by cheap throwaway troops. They're a very well-rounded army, but they have been superseded in many ways by other factions. If you like the idea of playing space pirates, play Druze or Dashat. Both of them really nail the feeling of playing a bunch of badass mercenaries, and both armies can also be expanded into other sectorials. Otherwise, just play regular Hak Islam. Steel Phalanx was created to fight the combined army, and they are pretty damn good at it. SP can use multiple Inamatarkos fire teams at the same time, with four members each. That means you can have two, or sometimes even three, main fire teams, all doling out punishment. That punishment comes in the form of lots of named characters and some of the best close combat in the game, combined with lots of health and armor also get to play with lots of named characters based on Greek mythology, and they're all great in close combat. The Greeks have average firepower and they're hard to hit. Steel Phalanx is unfortunately lacking in control pieces though. They have very few tools to form a repeater network, and only a few named hackers that are worth taking. If you think you can be aggressive enough to use the Enomotarkos fire teams, Steel Phalanx is worth a try. Toha are really cool, and unique, and interesting, and complicated, and extremely out of production. If you want to play Aliens, I encourage you to play the Combined Army, or better yet, Spiral Core. Spiral Core uses many Toha models, and it's much easier to acquire. If you do get your hands on Toha, or if you decide to proxy, you'll find that they're durable, flexible, and order efficient, with a preference for mid-range combat using viral rifles and spitfires. They have access to Symbio Armor, which is a slightly cheaper second or third or even fourth wound at the cost of some drawbacks to taking a wound. Their triads make for potent and flexible unit compositions. They can win with that flexibility, able to maneuver the smaller fire teams to where they can best be used, almost like you're solving a puzzle. The downsides are the Toha fire teams are where you live or die. If you don't understand fire teams, you won't play Toha. A mismanaged fire team will die easier than anything else. Furthermore, Toha are also quite bad at hacking. They rely on killing hackers, mechs, and heavy infantry the good old-fashioned way. Toha are great if you like winning with efficiency. So, do I think you should play with any of these armies? Well, if you want to, you should absolutely try them out and play them. Infinity supports pretty much every miniature that's been released. Unit profiles with models often get reborn as other models. The Specialist Order Sergeant is now a Trinitarian. The Ninja Sniper is now a Kunai Services Mercenary. Magister Knights with shotguns are now Teutonic Knights with shotguns. Every official army list is still available in the app. All the rules are still free of charge. 
And this is even for the ones that are just no longer in print. They're all very playable. Some of them even get updates, too. Newly released models like Wolfgang here can actually be used in Merovingia as well as Cosmoflot. But should you collect any of these armies? I think not. Definitely not if you're a new player. One of the great things about war games as a hobby is that you're not just using a bunch of abstract chess pieces. You're collecting miniatures, and presumably painting them up as well. It creates a synergistic effect. You have great gameplay supported by a rich backstory, executed with the tactile joy of moving miniatures around on a board. Collecting things is fun, and you get to collect an army as you see fit. With out-of-print sectorials, collecting is a dicey proposition. You're at the mercy of the second-hand market. And let's not forget that Corvus Belly is a much smaller company than other tabletop manufacturers like Asmodee or James. It's nice to support them by buying the shiny new stuff that's been designed and balanced around this edition as opposed to the older sectorials. Ultimately, I think it's great to want to play them, and by all means, I encourage you to play them. But to collect them? Nah. I don't want to tell anyone to get into something that they literally can't own. Definitely not for your first army. But don't despair. They might just bring back one of these out of print sectorials in the future. And when that happens, I'll make sure to put out a big update to discuss it so you better subscribe to the channel so you know about it. In the meantime, I would love to hear from the community about what sectorial simply must be reworked and relaunched. Until then, thanks for watching. Happy gaming. Happy gaming.